right. So good morning and thank you for joining us. I am Abby Burke, the Western Rivers Regional Program Manager for Audubon Rockies, your webinar host this morning, along with co-host Samantha Grant, our Western Rivers Senior Coordinator. As we begin, I want to extend a round of thanks to you, our audience, and my co-panelists this morning for sharing the start of your day with us. Hopefully we are sharing a virtual coffee or tea together as we gather online uh, for our part two of the legislator focused discussion on Colorado's proposed stream restoration legislation. Legislators, if you are able, I invite you to identify yourself and say hello to panelists in the chat and thank you for your service to our great state and, and offer a congratulations on reaching the halfway point of the 2023 legislative session. Next slide, please. For the smoothness of webinar function and accessibility, attendees have been muted and video sharing has also been disabled to preserve connectivity. We have over 220 registrants and we want to preserve our bandwidth. Please add questions to the chat at any time. As possible, panelists will answer questions in the chat and time permitting, we will hold questions and answers following all of our panelists presentations this morning. Next slide, please. Audubon looks at landscape conservation through the lens of birds and is invested in healthy watersheds, rivers and wetlands and working lands for birds and people. We work seamlessly with the Water for Colorado Coalition as well as the Healthy Headwaters Working Group to pursue goals that build resilience for our freshwater ecosystems and water supplies. Impacts of climate change are here. As a headwater state, we live these impacts through variable water supply, through wildfires, drought and flooding. Science is showing us the importance of healthy functioning rivers with connected floodplains for direct benefits to people and nature. There is an urgency to act regarding climate change, to keep healthy functioning rivers today and tomorrow, to continue to deliver the water we are used to for people and nature, and to take hold of currently available and competitive federal funding to support watershed and river health. The future of Colorado is dependent on clean, reliable water coming from healthy rivers and watersheds, our natural water supply infrastructure, and each of us are connected by it. Collectively as a state, from residents to decision makers, we need to lean in to learn more and participate in the decisions around our water resources. The decisions we make about water, watersheds, and river health impact all of Colorado. Next slide, please. With that introduction, I would like to welcome Senator Simpson. Senator Simpson is a native of the San Luis Valley and represents the Colorado State Senate District 6. Senator Simpson has a long-standing history and connection to water. He's a fourth generation farmer and rancher in the San Luis Valley and is the general manager of the Rio Grande Water Conservation District. Senator Simpson, welcome this morning and thank you for sharing your thoughts on the importance of Colorado's watersheds and upcoming stream restoration bill. When you're ready, the presentation is yours. Great, thank you, Abby. <clears throat> Such a pleasure to be here this morning. I, I've done at least one of these other uh, with the uh, Audubon Rockies over the last year or two since I've only been in the legislature two years. So appreciate the invitation um, and the opportunity. Look, I, I serve in kind of a unique capacity here at the legislature as being one of the few legislators that, that actually owns a water right. Um, and then likewise, as you mentioned, um, prior to serving here, and look, I do this in parallel paths. I'm still the general manager of the Rio Grande Water Conservation District in, in the uh, Rio Grande Basin. Um, I served on the Basin Roundtable. I've ser served on the Inner Basin Compact Committee. Currently, I serve in the legislature on the uh, Ag and, and uh, Natural Resources Committee. I serve on the Water Resources, Water and Ag Resources Review Committee. So uh, a unique engagement with water on multiple levels. and. Um, look, I'm also very appreciative of Kelly and, and DNR as they, they really engaged with me last summer about this conversation and, and the opportunities and the challenges around, you know, policies associated with stream restoration. You know, my, my Rio Grande Water Conservation District has a long history of supporting stream restoration projects in, in the San Luis Valley. And uh, always, you know, under the kind of the umbrella and the and a little bit of a challenge at time of, of uh, you know, recognizing and protecting the doctrine of prior appropriation. And 
the potential impacts that anything, anytime you're, you know, dealing with water channels, water streams, native flow diversions, it gets pretty nuanced and can get pretty complicated. Um, but we we all, at least in the Rio Grande Basin and in, in my district, um, in my community, have a uh, put a you know uh, significant value on what healthy rivers and streams mean as a diverter, as somebody that diverts water out of the Rio Grande River. What you know what it means to have a healthy system. So um, it's been an interesting conversation over the course of nearly the last year. Kelly Kelly was in my office yesterday again, trying to work through how. How do you, uh, you know, I know it's cliche, but how do we thread the proverbial needle here to, to enhance and protect the projects that we've supported, but again, being mindful of uh, the doctrine of prior appropriation and senior water rights and what that means to uh, me personally and, and my community. So um, it's been a terrific engagement. Uh, Kelly had the opportunity yesterday. We, uh, uh, for the first time in my tenure here, we actually had during session, what historically would have been called the Interim Water Resources and Agricultural Review Committee. Um, got successful legislation passed to remove that as interim, and now it's just the Ag and Water Review Committee. So yesterday was the first time during committee in my tenure where we got the legislatures, uh, legis at least the committee, the 10 legislators on that committee engaged in a thoughtful conversation about policy that's gonna be important. Um, to stakeholders, the, the ag community, the environmental community, the recreation community. Um, this is a, an interesting time and I feel pretty fortunate to be engaged um, at the right time and at the right place. I hope to uh, uh, really provide positive outcomes for everybody. So again, it's such a pleasure to be here, Abby. Uh, looking. The panelists know, uh, and folks that are listening, I got double booked today, and I'm supposed to be in the Capital Development Committee meeting right now. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, listen just a little bit more and then step out. But uh, um, either through Abby or through the legislative website, uh, folks online and listening, please uh, don't hesitate to engage. Reach out and and contact me, and I'm I'm happy to to be engaged. So I appreciate it, Abby. Uh, uh, thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Simpson, for your time this morning and your service to Colorado. I know your schedule is tight and we really appreciate you being with us um, this morning. Um, up next, I would like to introduce Kelly Romero Heaney, who serves currently as the Assistant Director of Water Policy for the Department of Natural Resources. Kelly has diverse experience in the private and government sector as a consultant, a hydrologist, environmental specialist and wildland firefighter for the U.S. Forest Service. Kelly, thank you and DNR and your team for your leadership and seeking a policy uh, solutions that, you know, positions Colorado for critical support for our functioning river systems, which are truly our natural water supply delivery infrastructure. When you are ready, Kelly, the presentation is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Abby. And I also just want to thank Senator Simpson, um, who has been willing to keep up the conversation on what's a really tricky policy issue. And, and so certainly appreciate his patience with us and his willingness, willingness to really um, work on some constru constructive solutions to a tricky issue. Um, so at the first webinar, I spoke about the need to restore the function and health of our natural streams um, and the barriers that, that communities and property owners face in doing so. Um, and then I also talked about how DNR is seeking to address those barriers. Um, but we heard from folks that um, they're, they're still unclear on, on why clarifying legislation is needed um, for stream restoration projects. So I did wanna provide some context today um, you know, as you see on this slide, and, and I think the other presenters are going to hit this as well, there's a lot of reasons that we in Colorado need and benefit from streams that have, that are, um, um, you know, have healthy, natural riparian areas, um, uh, and that, uh, and there's a lot of really important reasons that we can do, or there's a lot of need to do stream restoration in Colorado, but I won't belabor that point today. Um, if you could go to the next slide, that would be great. Um, 
So stream restoration projects intended to stabilize stream channels, create fish habitat, protect water quality, prepare for floods or to cover from fires have been happening in Colorado for decades. Um, and they can look like a lot of different projects, right? So it could be something like putting in a rock vein to stabilize a bank to protect uh, a roadway or farmland, or maybe to create fish habitat. Uh, next slide. Um, and also sometimes we use natural materials like coarse woody debris and, and root wads to provide channel complexity, habitat, and bank stabilization. Next one. Sometimes we shave off high banks, remove riprap or old levees to allow the channel to reconnect with its floodplain to help dissipate the energy from those flood flows to protect downstream uh, property, um, but also to promote conditions that support the growth of riparian vegetation that stabilizes the banks. Next slide. Sometimes there are streams that have been completely buried. Either they've been undergrounded through pipes or they've been buried by mine tailings like this slide here in the Swan River. Um, and uh, when we go to restore these uh, streams, we have to daylight them. Next. And then there's been a real movement in the last few years towards process-based restoration where the, the goal is to really restore the natural process of a stream. Beaver, of course, used to be more prevalent on the landscape. They provided certain water quality and, and um, uh, hydrographic benefits. Um, and so there are projects intended to sort of mimic that more uh, natural process. And these projects, of course, are occurring quite a bit in, in the headwaters. All right, next slide, please. So projects intended to stabilize stream channels, create fish habitat, protect water quality, et cetera. Um, you know, these all have been happening for a long time. Um, and you know, it was standard practice for many years um, for the division water resources or even water users um, uh, to allow projects to occur without a water right or, or what we call plan of augmentation. If a project was restored to the historic footprint of the natural stream system, meaning like the extent of the channel, the riparian area and the floodplain. Um, and then that historical footprint would have been verified with aerial photos, surveys and other standard methods. But as our streams come under, more streams come under administration and DWR is uh, asked to ensure efficient shepherding of water downstream, uh, they are taking a harder look at in-stream projects and structures and activities. Um, there are three elements in the statute that they must look at when administering a call uh, for water um, down, to a downstream right. They have to ask, are there diversions in the stream that are out of priority, meaning they don't have this, a sufficient water right to continue to divert? Are there activities in the natural stream that create conditions that would store water or maybe back up water so that it gets stored in the banks? And finally, are there unnecessary dams or obstructions obstructions impeding flow to downstream water rights. Um, so what does this have to do with a project that's just installing a structure to prevent bank erosion or daylight a stream, um, regrade a, a channel so it can reconnect with its floodplain? Um, I'll say this section of statute puts the Division of Water Resources and its water commissioners in a tricky position. We typically think of a diversion as a structure in the stream that diverts water to a head gate for use by a water provider or an agricultural producer. But statute isn't so clear and a water commissioner may look at a project that allows water to overtop or saturate banks as a diversion or an unnecessary obstruction, regardless if the extent of the project doesn't go beyond the historical footprint. Um, a structure intended uh, um, to control erosion so a landowner doesn't lose more hayfield or a bridge abutment is protected could be an obstruction of flow unnecessary to the conveyance of water to downstream uh, water rights. And then finally, a, a, a project that creates conditions that allow willows or cottonwoods or other riparian plants to grow could also be uh, viewed as a diversion. In these cases, a water commissioner could end up uh, feeling obligated to issue orders to a property owner um, requiring or a project proponent requiring that structures be removed or that a restoration project doesn't go forward um, or that that project be retrofitted after it's already been constructed. Um, so we're really putting project proponents in a position to either build their projects at risk or figure out how to go through a very 
challenging water court process that may or may not result um, in a water right being secured for a restoration project. So therein lies the policy question. Um, was it the General Assembly's intent when it passed laws regarding diversion, storage, and unnecessary obstructions? to require a water right for such actions, um, or is allowing work to occur within a natural stream permissible as long as it does not go beyond the historical extent of the stream, um, which uh, would, uh, and does that sufficiently protect a uh, water rights? Uh, restoration project proponents range from local governments to landowners, to water providers, to conservation organizations, to land management agencies. And these project proponents need clarity on what's allowed. Water right holders need clarity on what's allowed. And the division of water resources needs clarity on what's allowed. So the challenge before the Department of Natural Resources and the Colorado General Assembly and the water community is to consider the balance between stream restorations, large scale benefits relative to the potential small scale risk to water rates, and then certainly the disproportionate cost an effort of acquiring uh, a water right uh, for a stream restoration project and, and the, really the, the, the potential inability to even secure that. So thank you very much for the time. Hopefully that offered um, more clarification and I look forward to hearing the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you again, Kelly, for your leadership and open process in the stream restoration legislation pursuit. I really appreciate you and your team. Uh, next, I would like to welcome Chris Sturm. Uh, Chris is a longtime water uh, leader uh, within the Colorado Water Conservation Board, currently serving as the Watershed Program Director. Chris's program supports watershed planning as well as projects designed and constructed to restore and protect watersheds. The Watershed Program works directly with watershed and stream restoration, flood hazard mitigation, stream management plans, fluvial hazard zone mapping, and wildfire ready watersheds planning. Chris, we are thankful for your time this morning and your expertise and your presentation. When you're ready, the presentation is yours. Sure thing. Thanks a lot, Abby. It's a real privilege to be here this morning. Uh, and thanks to everyone who's attending. Samantha, let's jump into this thing and move to the next slide, please. Uh, and I'm going to talk you through the CWCB's wildfire ready watersheds program, which is part of our watershed health program. Uh, but first I'd like to talk about some of our philosophical approaches to watershed health uh, upon which we've built this program over the last 15 plus years. Uh, so when we talk about healthy watersheds, what does that mean to us? Uh, well, this is what it means here. These bullets that I have in no particular order, they're all equally as important, uh, but healthy watersheds maintain flow regimes for us uh, and hopefully at historic conditions. And what I'm talking about here is the hydrograph. Our hydrographs are changing uh, for different reasons and we want to maintain them uh, at close to historic conditions as we possibly can. This isn't just the magnitude of flow, this is also the timing in which we receive that flow and the rates and how quickly those rates change. Uh, so keep that in mind as we move forward. These watersheds are also able to resist and absorb and recover from natural hazards. They help us when we have droughts, when we have floods, uh, and after fires. This is the ecological definition of resilience. They provide high quality water for us for all our different uses around the state, each of which being incredibly important to the different users. And of course, they provide the complex habitat features uh, in both our upland and riverine environments. Next, please, Samantha. So, we have a lot of rivers in this state that I would call underachievers. Uh, they're not functioning near as well as they could be. Uh, they look pretty good from far, like this one in the Kawanichi Valley of Rocky Mountain National Park, but they're far from good. Uh, they're not very well connected with their floodplain, and they're not providing us with those elements of a healthy watershed uh, that we'd like to see. Uh, you know, and that's a spectrum of function there. Uh, next slide, please, Samantha. So in 2021 through Senate Bill 21240, the CWCB was tasked with assessing the susceptibility of our water uh, communities and infrastructure to post wildfire impacts. What is going to happen after fire? Uh, the CWCB looked at the bill and said, we could deliver on this. And we're also gonna add another element to it 
and provide a framework for communities so they can plan and implement mitigation strategies to minimize the post wildfire impacts and do this before the fires occur. Uh, and now I'm gonna talk through that for the next several slides, give you guys a feel for what we did. Uh, next slide, please, Samantha. So in our effort to look at statewide susceptibility to post wildfire impacts, we looked at values at risk. Uh, what are different values in the watershed that are susceptible to these post wildfire hazards? And the values are aquatic ecosystems, our water infrastructure, reservoirs, municipal intakes, agriculture uh, intakes, and ditches, and then transportation corridors, road crossings, and of course, life and property. All of those things are our values at risk. Now, when paired with these post wildfire hazards, hill slope erosion, debris, and mud flows, uh, and you can see the list there flooding. When those things go hand in hand, we show susceptibility. We are at risk. And that is what we looked at. Uh, and next slide, please. And we'll show you some of the results of what we came up with. We looked at this at very small watershed scales. The watersheds are roughly 10,000, 40,000 acres in size. They're called HUC 12s, Hydrologic Unit Code 12. Uh, we have roughly 4,500 of those in the state of Colorado. And as we see more presence of values at risk, that overlay with increasing potential for post wildfire hazards, we have increased susceptibility. Next slide, please. So here's our results at this HUC 12 level or these very small watershed scale level. Uh, and what we could see here is about the, the Western three fifths of the state there is susceptible to post wildfire hazards. Uh, and there's different ways of looking at it. Samantha, let's run to the next one, please. Uh, we aggregated this and averaged it uh, by county, uh, so you could see the, the risks there. And again, anything yellow to red, we have a very likely presence of post-wildfire uh, hazard susceptibility. Uh, next slide, please, Samantha. And just one more look at it. Uh, I averaged this at larger watershed scales, uh, about the size of the Big Thompson or the Roaring Fork or the Blue River. Uh, or the animus, for example, so that you could just look at it a different way. Uh, next slide, please, Samantha. On our website, which I will link at the very end of the presentation here, we also have a post-fire susceptibility explorer. There's a lot of data uh, in those three maps that you just saw previous to this. Uh, but in this explorer, you could further break down the data and say you're just interested in reservoirs. That's the example I have here. And let's say we're interested in reservoirs susceptible to post wildfire debris flows. Uh, so this is an opportunity where you can play with this data and look at different values at risk, as well as different hazards and see the different susceptibility. Next slide, please, Samantha. So jumping into the second part of what we achieved in this program, uh, we developed a wildfire ready action plan. This is the framework that helps local communities and stakeholders do what we did at the statewide level, uh, but do it with a lot more detail at their local level. Uh, they may have a watershed of interest that's their municipal water supply, or there's a lot of ditches to gather water uh, below a certain watershed, and the agricultural community is interested in protecting that water supply. Or ideally, those groups are working together to protect their water supply. Uh, so we've developed this uh, wildfire ready action plan. We base it on a lot of lessons learned from flood recovery and the 15 year history of this watershed program. Um, and it is available on our website. And we also have a grant program uh, through some subsequent legislation that appropriated $10 million to the CWCB uh, to go towards mitigating wildfire impacts. Next slide, please. So just quickly, what does the Wildfire Ready Action Plan look like? We didn't, we weren't interested in producing some big novel that everyone had to read through and figure it out. Uh, we put together a template scope of work so that a group can jump right in. Uh, it's at a level of detail that it could be released through a request for proposals to direct, to hire a firm to implement. Uh, and just quickly, uh, the first two tasks are oriented around the a social piece of the process, developing goals and objectives and stakeholder collaboration and outreach. Then we jump into data collection. This is the real heart of the program, collection around your values at risk. Where are your intakes? 
Uh, where is your agricultural infrastructure exist across the landscape and road crossings and structures? And then identifying the gaps in that data is an important piece. Then we move into the post wildfire hazard analysis, uh, developing models that show us what it looks like in a post fire environment what the flooding, what the departure and flow from a pre and post fire uh, flood would look like, debris flow pathways, et cetera. Uh, then we look at the risk where we pair those values at risk with the hazards to define our susceptibility. And then the last piece, the most important piece, it's not a plan until we identify actions. What can be done before the fire to mitigate these impacts and what could be done after? Next, please, Samantha. Back, go back. Okay. Nope. All right, we could skip the fact sheets. Uh, we have a lot of fact sheets associated with that as you look through that template scope of work. But anyway, what does this look like in the real world? Um, well, we've done this before, but we haven't had the luxury of doing it before the fire. We've done it after the fire. I would say that during and after disaster is not a very good time to ask people to be incredibly innovative. Uh, we're worried about a lot of things. We tend to be very conservative in our approach. Uh, so what we're looking at here is the East Troublesome Fire. We took a lot of this value at risk data uh, that we received from the Northern Water District and Grand County, uh, and we paired it with the post wildfire hazards. And we came up with these hotspots. Here's our areas of concern. We have communities here that are likely to flood. We have water infrastructure here that is at risk. Um, and this helped us direct the federal government through the NRCS to places on the ground to develop their damage survey reports and implement projects. Now, what happens after the fire is we usually get these point of impact type projects that protect areas at a site. They don't do a whole lot for us for watershed health. And think back to my first slide there that talked about why are we doing this? Uh, next slide, please. So after fire, we did at the 2020 fires, we saw a lot of aerial mulching. Uh, that's helpful in speeding up watershed recovery. I'll tell you what it's not helpful for. If a big storm sets up, it does not prevent us from catastrophic debris flows. Um, and they invariably happen over our fires. So the approach to wildfire ready watersheds is to identify areas that we can use that function well to hold back debris and slow the flow of water to protect our values at risk. Now in this area, we see this wonderful riparian area. Uh, it was not assessed before the fire, didn't have an opportunity to say, is this gonna function well for us or not? Uh, in the slide in the upper right, uh, it looks like a healthy riparian area, but I can't tell you if that channel is well connected with that stream, with that riparian, with the floodplain or not. So these are things we would like to know in advance so that we can do restoration activities to improve the function, or if it's functioning well, we can identify it for protection. Next slide, please, Samantha. So just a quick uh, overview of the CWCV's Watershed Restoration Program, um, types of projects that we do. Kelly walked us through a lot of these, the bottom left there. She had an example from the Swan River there. I like to call that a river resurrection project. Uh, but on the upper left and right here, we have a wetland restoration project. Uh, these are very good for all of these elements of why do we want watershed health. This helps protect our hydrograph. I think these types of projects become more important as we look at our snowpack melting out earlier and earlier as the years go by. I think these types of projects can help us protect that rate at which we're receiving the water downstream to more historic levels. Um, we also do ditch diversion projects, which you can see at the bottom there, uh, kind of the middle left there is an alluvial fan restoration project that was done after the Waldo Canyon fire. Again, the idea we need to hold back sediment and debris and slow the flow to protect our values at risk. We also do goalie stabilization, we do a lot of river restoration projects after disasters, which we see in the last two photos on the bottom right there. The CWCB has spent in the last 15 years, close to $150 million 
on these types of projects to restore our waterways, protect our hydrographs, um, and to help us become more resilient. Uh, next slide, please, Amanda. So I think you guys probably got a flavor of this if you were at the first workshop through Dr. Ellen Wool's work, but I wanted to reiterate it. Uh, she has this concept of river beads and river, and river strings uh, where these beads are depositional areas. So these are areas of lower gradient um, that naturally slow the flow of water. They hold sediment, they hold wood, they are good for carbon sequestration uh, and they provide increased habitat for aquatic species. Historically, we had a lot of these across the landscape. Um, today, we don't have near as many. I don't think we're ever going to see a time where we go back to where we were historically. Uh, there's simply too much development in our floodplains to promote that. But I do think we should be a function, we should be focusing on restoring these areas where we can for lots of different reasons. Um, and I gave you some examples today, but one primary reason is to protect our downstream values at risk. Next slide, please, Samantha. Uh, and this is what it might look like naturally on the landscape. Uh, Katie Yacht provided this slide for me and I really appreciate that, Katie. These areas could function very well during fires um, to service fire breaks. After fires, they hold sediment and debris very well. If we never have a fire, they serve to protect our flow regime um, and they also impart resiliency to other disasters that we might experience, including drought, including floods that we might experience without a fire. Uh, as our climate warms, our atmosphere has the potential to hold more moisture and we do see larger storm events uh, and they can have catastrophic effects even when they come off a watershed that hasn't burned. Next slide, please. So that's what I have. I really appreciate everyone's time this morning. Please have a look at our website, wildfirereadywatersheds.com. If you go to the action plan tab, you can get more information about the template scope of work and the grant program that is serving to implement this program. Thank you. Great, thank you, Chris. Outstanding information. Um, really appreciate it. We'll make sure that we have uh, this link and the information for you, um, you know, as attendees this morning uh, when we reply back with our recording in the blog around this. So thank you, Chris, for sharing about the Wildfire Ready Watersheds Program and the connections with stream restoration in Colorado. Samantha, if you could back up just one slide, please. Thank you. Uh, we've heard uh, a lot of questions on scale of stream restoration and kind of how many projects. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of a, a picture of that. Over the last several years, I've had the privilege to work with statewide basin roundtable, environmental and recreational representatives on a variety of topics, uh, most recently on data gaps and project needs for the update processes of the basin implementation plans or BIPs which were completed in 2022 and the newly released 2023 water plan. With the BIP and water plan update now complete, there are numerous areas where both the BIPs and water plan uh, references the, and points towards stream restoration for resilience building. Matt Lindbergh of Brown and Caldwell and contractor for the BIP and water plan update researched the number of restoration projects in the 2022 BIPs for us. Matt and his team created the project's database for projects with the primary word of watershed health, environment and recreation and restoration or riparian in the project name. And I wanna show you that there was over 110 projects were identified in this kind of restoration category. And the cost of the projects were over 110 million. A third of these 110 projects though did not have costs associated with them. So the total cost for these projects is actually much higher. So most projects did not identify a reach length, although some did. Um, and some projects were solely focused on river and habitat restoration, but some were multiple purpose projects that incorporated storage rehabilitation, irrigation head gate rehabilitation, stakeholder outreach and planning. Um, additionally, Matt and his team provided a summary by basin of projects. In the interest of time, I just want to share with you a very high level summary that nearly all of the basin implementation plans listed multiple project achievements 
that planned for or implemented projects that improved and restored watersheds, streams, and habitat. All of the BIPs had goals that seek to protect, enhance, or restore environmental and recreational attributes. Next slide, please. Additionally, on scale projects, we've heard a lot of questions about historical footprint and stream restoration work, and all of this directly relates to scale and has an incorporated limit for future projects. Uh, and there's no one better to talk about this than Katie Lott. So I'd like to welcome Katie to the presentation. Katie is a senior engineer and fluvial geomorphologist for watershed science and design. Katie specializes in risk-based flood planning and river restoration projects, fluvial hazard zone mapping and mitigation, hydraulics and hydrology, sediment transport, floodplain reconnections, and riparian function uh, studies. Katie has spent years in the design, analysis, and implementation of multi-benefit projects that provide water quality, safety, and environmental value to river systems and their communities. She's also developed and published risk-based analysis methods for quantifying the ecologic or agricultural benefits and impacts of large scale river and reservoir reoperation projects. So thank you, Katie, so much for joining us this morning. The presentation is yours. Great, thank you, Abby, and thank you all for um, sticking, sticking with me this morning. Um, yeah, I, I'm gonna start with a couple things that maybe Kelly already talked about a little bit, but I just quickly am gonna go through some of the reasons why we do river restoration and then some of the major concepts we use to kind of get from these, these big ideas into what's actually implemented on the ground and talk about how the historical footprint um, ties into that. So, you know, typically I think when we all think about river restoration or the general public thinks about river restoration, we think about projects like this, which are primarily for an ecologic benefit or for ecologic uplift, but river restoration is a tool that's used in so many other facets of river management. Um, next slide. So river restoration is used as a tool um, to support sport fishing, um, boating, kayaking, and the communities and the economies that these drive throughout our state. Next slide. Um, River restoration is also a tool that we use to protect existing and new development from flooding and hazards from erosion and sedimentation. Next slide. Um, as Kelly also said, um, we use re river restoration to clean up after mining, major mining activities and the legacies of our, um, you know, legacies of our past. And we use it to create new spaces for people to access natural environments and to protect land and return it to agriculture. Next slide. We also use river restoration as a tool to mitigate and respond to flash floods after fires, which is a little bit what Chris talked about. Um, sometimes, sometimes these flash floods can be deadly and sometimes they can come without warning. And so having projects built in the ground before um, the rain falls on the burn scars is critically important. Next slide. We also use river restoration to respond to and repair rivers and communities after major natural and human disturbances in efforts to prevent damage and um, repair you know, and repair damage to life and property and human safety. Next slide. We also use it to protect human infrastructure from erosive forces and the impacts of sediment and deposition. And this is not a familiar photo to you. This is the uh, this is Glenwood Canyon in the summer of 2021 after the um, major debris flows after the fires there, which shut down I-70. River restoration is the tool we use to start to clean this up and ensure that I-70 can continue to, to be passable throughout the rest of the year. Next slide. And of course, um, we use river restoration as a tool to restore communities after major flood events. And this is a photo of Drake um, after the 2013 flood. Next slide. So what are some major concepts that we use in river restoration? Um, next slide. The, one of the big ones is this idea of, of a historical footprint or sometimes I call it the active stream corridor but it's essentially the space that a stream can influence when it's energized with large amounts of water and sediment and debris. 
rather whether that be from just kind of a standard flood like we saw in 2013 or if it's a flood after a fire like Chris was talking about. Um, the historical footprint is pretty easy to see after a major flood event, but we don't need a major flood to be able to determine what it is. There's a lot of tools and a lot of data, some of which I think were talked about in the last webinar, including historical aerial photos, um, wetland maps, topographic maps, et cetera, to kind of get an idea of the extent of this historical footprint. We need to know this historical footprint because it's important for us as river engineers, as river scientists, as river managers, and as communities who live near rivers um, to be able to manage both for the high flows, like you see in this photo, but also for the low flows, those low summer flows where the, you know, the very bottom of the channel is just barely, barely wet. Next slide. And as I mentioned, the historical footprint is pretty easy to see after a flood and rivers have a tendency to repeat their actions through time. So again, this is the Big Thompson River in the same location in 1976 and 2013. Um, and you can see that the river is taking up the same amount of space in both of those images, despite them being 40 years apart. Next slide. So once we have the idea of the historical footprint or the area of space that the stream influences and has influenced in the past and will influence into the future, we take a look at the constraints. Um, just, you know, when we, when we think about the historical footprints, that's not the space that we are able to typically design our projects to take up because of the investments that we as humans have made in river corridors and, um, in the yeah in river corridors and in these locations so in this example this project was highly highly constrained by a number by a number of human investments and a number of things that are really important to the community um, in this location so ne uh, next slide um, the first being a um, group of residential or a couple residential um, homes a restaurant and a business and then also the drake post office Next slide. Another constraint is US 34 that runs through here, this major thoroughfare between Loveland and Estes Park, probably the, uh, the major way that Rocky Mountain National Park is accessed. Next slide. And then additionally, what you can't really see in these photos is there's a campground um, up here kind of in the upper left corner of the photo. And that's really important to, um, you know, to the commercial viability of this space and the business owners and the residents that live in this location. So when you take a look at all of these um, and on top of our historical footprint, what we're left with is an opportunity space. So next slide. And this is the space in which we typically have to actually implement river restoration projects. And within this, you know, within this opportunity space, it's the space that we have to express the community's values about how they want to use and how they want to interact with their rivers. So next slide. Working, working in Drake um, or working in this area, a couple things came up. Um, for one, you know, one of the major things that I just mentioned was that there's a there's a campground, and that um, fishing you know, fishing and recreation within the North Fork of the Big Thompson River was a, was a major community value because that was what was bringing people to come and stay in that campground and spend money in that location. Of course, other community values were that the roads needed to remain passable and the bridges need to, needed to remain clear um, so folks could get in and out um, both for kind of their day to day, but also in, you know, in major events and, and during floods. Next slide. So this is what that looks like on the ground before any work was done up there, um, although there was a little bit of work. So, you know, some major problems where the bridge was completely filled with sediment. Um, very little water could pass under it. Some, some water is passing over it. Um, the restaurant and homes were effectively at the same elevation as the river, meaning that they were highly susceptible to flooding and that there was no space for folks to come in and access, you know, access the river and access the fishery um, to support that campgrounds that, that, is, that is in this reach. Next slide. And this is, this is what we ended up with. 
um, at the end of the project. This was taken last year. Um, so we got the sediment out. We made, you know, we restored the ability of um, high flows to pass through this reach and under the bridge. Um, we restored the fishery, which then, or the, the fish habitat, which then was able to support um, people coming in and using the space. Uh, you can actually see in the photo that there's some some lounge chairs down there and a fire pit, um, all which supports um, the campground, the restaurant, and the and the local economy. Next slide, please. Um, and then when we get it right, we get notes like this left on our equipment. Um, river restoration is not done without, without community involvement and river restoration is done purely, almost purely um, for the expression of the values of the community and the river that we're working in. It's, it's not something that's mandated. Um, all of these projects are done voluntarily and with community support. Next slide. And then one more, just one more quick example of the historical footprint. So this is, and why it's important. Um, this is US 50 and then the and Tom, Tomichi Creek um, down in the Gunnison Basin. Tomichi Creek run, is running right to left here. And you can see that the creek has been pushed up against the highway and the creek is actively eroding the highway embankments in a couple of these locations where it's been pushed up um, against its margins. And so if we, as designers or we as a community were, um, were unable or were forced to only work within the current channel location due to regulations or due to you know, any other kind of overarching thing, what we would have to do is we would have to fill that channel, we would have to put riprap in, we would have to spend, I mean, this would be a five to $10 million project um, to try to protect the highway. But because we are able to work throughout the historical footprints, um, next slide, there's options that are both much cheaper and provide much, um, much more benefit to the protection of Highway 50 and provide much more ecological uplift. And in this location, it's wholesale moving the channel into one of its previous locations. Um, so what this does or what this would allow us to do if we were to do this would be to take the pressure off the US 50 embankments um, by moving the channel and then also creating a new um, vegetated shaded channel that runs through this reach. Next slide. Um, and then my final point is that stream corridors are already highly, highly regulated spaces. Um, I almost put this with the constraint slide, but it didn't really fit. Um, there's so many regulations, both, um, you know, kind of from the Army Corps of Engineers um, with the 404 permits and the Clean Water Act. Um, there's a huge set of regulations that comes in these, you know, in working in these spaces from FEMA um, and local jurisdictions. And so, you know, kind of on top of all of that, there's already a very, very strict and robust structure of regulations um, through these spaces that dictate both what we as restoration practitioners and flood mitigation practitioners can do, but also what developers are allowed to do and what, um, you know, the measures that agriculture is able to take um, within these spaces. So I just want to point that out that this, you know, stream corridors are not a free for all as they exist right now. Um, and, you know, adding what, what we're looking at is we really want to kind of proceed with this without putting an undue burden upon um, our practice and our ability to, re to recognize and fulfill some of these community roles. Mm. That's what I got. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Extraordinary information. Thank you for walking us through really the life of, of a restoration project with us. And so I want to thank everybody. You probably saw in the chat, we're a little bit over in our time. Um, uh, myself, other panelists, we will work to respond to your uh, your questions that you have submitted in the chat. We'll do that by email. Um, next slide, please, Samantha. Actually, all the way to the last one, please. And I want to uh, thank you again, uh, and thank you to our co-panelists and uh, to your audience for sharing your morning to learn more about the upcoming stream restoration legislation. Hope you found this information useful and welcome your feedback. Um, please, uh, you know, we're a little bit over, but we're gonna conclude this morning uh, to allow 
of legislators specifically to get to the floor a few moments. And I also have a question for you here on this last slide. Would a deeper look at stream restoration projects in a future webinar in early April, would that be helpful? Um, if that would be helpful, please email myself or please e you know, send a message into the chat. Um, but we really thank you for your time this morning. And we're gonna hang on here just for a few moments to see if any uh, answers kind of populate into that third webinar series, going deeper into projects. Um, but we really thank you again for your time this morning and please feel free to sign off when you're ready. And um, we will certainly be um, responding to all these great questions. Thank you for all the great um, thanks and appreciation in the chat. And again, just reflecting that back to our co-panelists this morning, really appreciate it, everybody. So thank you again. Um, have a great rest of your day. And again, we'll hang on here just for a few more moments and let the chat kind of populate another moment. So thank you again, panelists. Thank you, audience. Have a great day.